Then I say uh, hi and uh, uh, welcome to today's uh, live Cohera session where we'll be we'll be discussing the ins and outs of small cap investing with uh, a Nordic and European perspective. Uh, with me today, I have Petter Lökvist, who is a small cap manager from Sweden, managing the Humler Small Blogs Fund, and Kenneth Blomqvist from Finland, Helsinki, managing well a number of funds uh, with a small cap and mid cap tilt. Um, first of all, uh, welcome, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, to start with, I, I was just thinking that you could um, give a brief introduction of your respective fund companies and your roles within each company. So, Petter, if you could start, that would yeah. be great. Yeah, so my name is Petter Lökqvist. I, uh, I'm uh, the, the lead portfolio manager for Humle Fonder, where, where we manage two mandates uh, so far, uh, one small cap mandate and one uh, Swedish all cap mandate. Uh, the small cap mandate has a Nordic uh, investment focus, uh, where we look for for Nordic uh, small and mid caps uh, across across the Nordic region, uh, I have a long background as a, as a portfolio manager. I manage small cap Nordic small cap funds since uh, 2010, and worked in this industry since uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Kenneth Lundqvist, uh, working for Fondita in Helsinki, Finland. <coughs> We're a mutual fund company that was uh, established in '97, uh, focusing wow. both on on uh, smaller companies first in no the Nordic area and then then also Europe. And then we have a couple of thematical funds. And my responsibility is and main uh, I'm the main uh, portfolio manager of uh, the uh, managing two of our European uh, funds: one European microcap fund and one European small cap fund. And then I also help my colleague uh, who is managing our Nordic uh, uh, small cap funds and been doing this since uh, 99 and and working uh, I've been working for Fondita since 2011. And and from my perspective you have quite a similar approach to, to investing but you have a geographical exposure that is somewhat different so so Patrick you're very focused on the Nordics and Sweden foremost uh, whereas Kenneth you have more of a European perspective is that correct? Yeah. Um, that is true. Although we, 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 I mean, invest in in the Nordic region as well in our European fund. So, yeah, yeah. And, and Kenneth, you're also talking about micro caps, and I would like to start with <laughs> defining the small cap space to start with, because uh, uh, when when someone talks about small caps, it it I think it's it makes sense to actually know what what you're talking about. So, um, what would you say is the definition of small caps to start with? Uh, from our perspective, uh, I mean, we, we see that uh, a micro cap is, is, a, is a company that uh, has a market cap under 800 million euros and, and then a small in the, in the Euro European space. And then uh, a company that has a market cap under uh, 4 billion is, is a, small, a small cap, uh, sm small cap. So that is how we, are, we, we, we see it. And, and, and uh, is it is it just this is it just the size that determines whether a company is a small or micro cap? Uh, it's the size that that uh, that defines it, and uh, and then of course if you look at the European space, uh, uh, I would say that the most of the 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 micro caps they are more local players, and then the small cap uh, uh, companies they are more European or even international uh, companies. Mm -hmm. And Petter, from your perspective, do you have the same definition on a small cap? Well, we, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I mean, the Swedish kind of def definition of a small cap, which has been established, is that it's it's a company which is we, where the market cap is less than one percent of the market where where the, the share is listed. Which, for for Swedish uh, companies, it means that the small cap definition is close to one hundred billion Swedish krona. Uh, th that would be according to the definition a small cap company uh, but however uh, our view is that uh, i mean real small cap is found uh, on, a, on a much sm smaller scale in that uh, sense so we, we generally look for companies uh, in the range of 5 to 15 20 billions uh, that that's uh, uh, swedish that is uh, that's the kind of ideal size of uh, investments uh, from, from our side uh, even though that uh, the definition says, says something else. Mm -hmm. 
But does that mean that there are a number of funds also, I mean, small cap funds by definition that that goes into larger companies? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, since I mean the investment, uh, I mean uh, the statutes uh, of uh, a lot of the companies, uh, and also our fund is that we could actually invest in companies which are uh, less than one percent of, uh, of uh, the total market cap of Stockholm Stock Exchange. But uh, but I mean but. I mean, and that, I mean, I, I guess it forces uh, uh, certain uh, fund management companies with a lot of AUM to actually invest in larger and larger companies and, uh, and using that kind of mandate uh, going up in market cap size. Uh, that is not a problem for, for our, from our side, at, uh, I mean, for, for years to come, I guess. Mm. And, and before we go, I... yeah. I could add here just that we see the same thing there in, in Europe, but we have this, uh, decided to, 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 to keep the, the market cap limits uh, and it doesn't matter if the uh, stock market goes up and down. And then when we invest in a micro cap, uh, it's typically a two to three, perhaps 400 million market cap uh, company, but it can be also around 100 million. So, so we would like to start with an investment there and then the company can grow in 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 the portfolio mm. and before we go into the opportunity set of small cap companies can you just briefly describe your your investment process and then your philosophy uh, behind your funds um, how do you end up with a portfolio of like 30 40 names from from a universe that is much bigger to start with shall i Petty. start yeah Petty. uh i mean I'm a very fundamental person in, in terms of finding investments, and I'm, I'm a very true believer that, that uh, profit growth and, and uh, share price uh, uh, development over time is, uh, is very well correlated over time. So uh, I look for uh, what we say in, in our investment philosophy is to tr we're trying to find companies uh, that uh, and invest in companies that, uh, that actually has a the prospects of actually outgrowing the market and the competitors over time. So uh, that is the fundamental base of, of the analysis we do. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and the process, I mean, we, we have uh, several hundreds of uh, close to 1000 companies in the Nordics, which are classified as, as small cap companies. And you need to have, have, have some way of uh, narrowing it down. We have a I mean, based on my fundamental uh, fundamental uh, basis, we have a I mean, kind of a quant quantitative screening model, which uh, screens out based on profit growth, based on uh, or sales growth, margin development, uh, return on equity, and then and, uh, and, uh, the leverage uh, level in the company. Uh, uh, yeah, that we could single out which which companies are good or bad, and we try to uh, to look uh, among the companies that are good from that perspective. Then, then it's very important. I mean, from that set, we, we narrow it down from thousand down to a few hundred, and that is still too much. So uh, um, there is quite a lot of uh, activity that is uh, related to meeting with companies that we find interesting, uh, talking to. I mean, brokers, analysts, uh, sector specialists and stuff like that. And, and, and most importantly, talking to a lot of companies, because I mean, a, a meeting with one company could generate an idea to look for another company. And then uh, then we dig into to, uh, further down into the fundamental analysis where we look. Uh, I mean, we, we do our own analysis on where this company could be. Uh, going three to five years uh, down the, the road, and uh, uh, we make our own assumptions on on, on uh, growth and margins and stuff like that. Uh, and from that, we can derive a, a potential value or a, or a conviction level that we think this company is good or bad. Uh, and based on that, we then uh, uh, select them on, among among the companies where we have high conviction and, and put together a portfolio of some thirty five to forty companies. Uh, which we believe have a good potential uh, three to five years from now. Okay, and Kenneth, your your approach is that a similar one, or does it differ? We haven't sat down with Peter yet to talk about these things, but it sounds <laughs> like he is working like we are. So <laughs> that's uh, great to hear. No, but uh, 
I mean, the European space is uh, much, much bigger uh, than, than the Nordic one. So, so you need to have this very discipl disciplined um, type of uh, investment process here. So, so what we start with is a similar thinking that, okay, what, do we, what type of companies would we like to invest in? Okay, would we would like to invest in companies that are growing over time. And uh, for us, it's uh, of interest that there is some type of structural underlying growth trend that uh, that uh, the, the company could or a possible investment could capitalize on and uh, so so that is one important thing and then then we want to see that that uh, the, the company the business model already works so we don't jump in uh, into to turn around cases or a company that perhaps will make money sometimes in the future for us it's very important to see that the business model al already works the company has uh, has uh, nice uh, profitability, uh, cash flow in order, balance sheet in order. Especially when you invest in smaller companies, it's very important that the balance sheet is in order because it could be so that the, the company is a niche player and you are very dependent still on one country and one market. And then uh, if there suddenly is are tougher times ahead, then then this should not be an issue for the company. So. So that is very important, and 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 then uh, we like uh, to see that there is some type of uh, entrepreneurial type of uh, uh, owner in the company. Perhaps the founder or a family, someone who has put his or her own money at stake. And and usually companies that have a, a, an owner or a management team that own shares in the company, they they tend to do better decisions over time. So that is very important. Mm -hmm. But as Peter mentioned there also, we, we have a quantitative uh, screening where we look for, for growth, uh, growth companies that can grow. So, so uh, that is important. And then, as I mentioned, balance sheet and so forth. And then um, ESG and these type of things are also very important for, for, for us today. So when we do a screening, we... we <clears throat> We, we, we tend to, to uh, not invest in, 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 in certain type of companies that have, for example, uh, uh, over 5% of their uh, revenues comes from alcohol or tobac tobacco uh, and, uh, or fossil fuels and, and so forth. So, so via this, we try to, to narrow the, the possible uh, investment uh, uh, universe that we are looking for. And then, then me and my colleague, we, we, we meet a lot of companies and via that we get interesting ideas also. Uh, and, and then we use, uh, as, as Europe is, is quite a large uh, market. So, so how, how, how I'm thinking here and how I'm working is that I had defined a couple of interesting uh, uh, partners or counterparts in, in all the countries that I work with. So. Uh, where, where I know the analysts and they know how uh, I'm working. So I have a close uh, collaboration with them uh, locally. And uh, that I think is a very important thing also because they know what is happening in the market locally. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, conviction and uh, is very important uh, what comes then to the company after we have met them. And, and we also have around 35 to, uh, to 40 names in the fund. When we do an investment, it's a five year plus thinking. We're not investing just because this year will look great. And But then of course things can happen on the way, which means that you sell earlier. But uh, if I look at the portfolios that, that we have, we have investments that have been there uh, for, uh, for uh, over five years and also uh, over 10 years. So. This is how, 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 in a nutshell, how we are thinking and, and then what type of companies we are looking for. Yeah. And Petra, I know that ESG is part of, integrated yeah. part of your process as well. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, apart from that, we are, uh, I mean, negatively screen. I mean, the, the kind of sectors that cannot mention the, the tobacco, the alcohol, the controversial uh, sectors, etc. Uh, it, it's a very uh, integral part of of, uh, of the investment analysis we do. We have um, uh, we're focusing in. I mean, since, since we're we're meeting the companies 
quite often uh, the ones we own. And I worked in this industry for some 20 years now. So I tend to, you tend to get to know the management teams and stuff like that uh, during the way. Uh, and, the, and the good thing about that is that you actually can also, in terms of ESG, uh, have a quite deep down discussions on, on uh, I mean, for me, it's important to, I mean, not only to, to have tables where you can uh, see if they have, uh, I mean, personnel policy or uh, stuff like, I mean, things that you just check off. It, it, the important thing for me and, and the thing that drives value is trying to identify what, uh, what kind of opportunities uh, uh, the ESG situation the company sits in today uh, gives in terms of uh, better market position, uh, stronger competitiveness, etc. cetera. Uh, if that could add to the, to the investment case that we build, but also to identify if there are any potential risks that we should be aware of and we should take into consideration in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the investment case as such. Uh, so, we, we, uh, I mean, in the company meetings we have, we, we, we bring these kind of questions in order to identify our view on, on uh, the ESG opportunities and uh, the risks and, or threats as such, and trying to incorporate that into I mean, the, the long-term uh, I mean, profit growth potential for the company. So it's, um, it, it's very important part. Mm. And I will bring us to uh, the asset class as such, the, the small cap investment universe. And uh, you brought with you some slides on the opportunity set and the historical development of, of that asset class. I, I will try to just bring that up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so this is the long-term development for small caps. Kenneth, you can comment on that and why it looks like this. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, this picture is from, from the US. and. Uh, but, but what it tells us actually is that uh, if you have invested one dollar in 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 different asset different asset class classes, uh, shall we say one hundred years back, uh, there is a, today a huge difference, and and uh, and uh, uh, the annual <coughs> return what comes to small caps has been twelve percent, and then for large caps ten uh, percent, and then for bonds uh, much lower but uh, of course this is historic uh, an historical picture um, but uh, we we still see that that uh, this will most probably be the case also in the future because uh, uh, smaller companies have the the the, the potential uh, to to grow uh, much faster uh, than than already established large multinational companies and uh, and uh, uh, as uh, Peter mentioned there in the in the beginning, that you want to invest in companies where profits are growing because over time the stock price should move in the same direction. And uh, and here we see that that uh, also in the future, small caps they have the possibility to grow much faster than large large companies, and uh, uh, they have the possibility to, for example, in 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 Europe. Uh, where the home market, uh, uh, for example, if you are a German company, is uh, with 80 million people uh, living there. I mean, it's it's already huge in in Germany. And then, at some point in time, you can can uh, take uh, or uh, the company, uh, if it start, when it starts to be uh, established in in Germany, you have the possibility to then go outside of of, of your border. So. Uh, nice uh, growth potential over time. Then these are, as I mentioned there earlier, entrepreneurial type of companies. So uh, uh, should should do better over time. And uh, then you often see that that smaller companies they grow both organically but also via acquisitions and uh, and by by buying companies, integrating and growing by. by uh, uh, through a both an organic and an uh, acquisition type of, of strategy, and and uh, if you find these type of companies, then then over time uh, this should be an, uh, a good a good investment, and and then uh, perhaps the fourth thing also is that um, uh, usually many of these smaller companies are not that well, well analyzed by investors and uh, and analysts, and uh, that. 
goes for small caps, but especially for micro caps. And then if you have time to, to focus only on that segment, then you have the possibility to, to, to find interesting long term investments. And yeah. yeah. And this is another chart showing more or less the same thing. Um, yeah, the, the, you... this one shows uh, the same situation in Europe the last 20, uh, 20 years. And, uh, and uh, what we also can see here is that uh, uh, usually when there is a crisis out there, you see the financial crisis or last year's uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis, uh, you see that small caps usually underperforms. And, uh, and of course, timing is very, very difficult in, in, in when to buy stocks or, or when to buy a certain type of, 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 of company or, or stock. But, uh, but uh, over time, uh, usually a dip. And when small caps underperforms, that is a buying opportunity for the long term investor. Yeah. And Petter Sweden looks very much the same. It looks quite the same. I mean, uh... I mean, this is not uh, that long time series, but uh, since 2002, and it's interesting. I mean, the fact the yellow one is, of course, the, the small cap, uh, the Swedish small cap market is such a, a phenomenal uh, development since 2002, uh, summing up to some uh, four, 13, 14 percent uh, annualized uh, returns. For, for small cap, and I should have brought that one, but because if you if you put the the profit uh, development for for the Carnegie Small Cap Index since two thousand and two uh, in this graph as well, it would you would see that uh, I mean profits has grown approximately 13, 14 percent uh, annually as well. So there is a very, very strong correlation between uh, profits and and share price development over time. Because I mean, if if we would if you look at the blue one, which is the OMX uh, 30 index, the large cap companies, I mean, the annualized returns is some six, seven percent and the same. Uh, it, it's the same level as the, the profit growth over that time as well. So profits and, uh, and share, share price returns uh, correlates over time. And, uh, and, uh, and the interesting thing, I mean, I mean, we have more or less the same pictures, me and Kenneth, but this is somewhat, somewhat uh, different looking at uh, the uh, annual returns in the graph, uh, just as uh, Kenneth mentioned that uh, in, in bad times, uh, I mean, still 15 out, out of the past 19 years, uh, small cap has, has actually outperformed uh, uh, Swedish small cap compared to Swedish market as such. And uh, I mean, in, 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 in times where, where everything correlates to one, the liquidity uh, dilemma of, of, uh, of small cap makes the, the small caps uh, really, be, be really hurt. In the, it happens in the financial crisis, in the European debt crisis stuff. And, and also we had the same situation in, uh, I mean, in, just in, in, uh, in March, when, uh, March 2020, when, uh, when COVID, COVID hit. Um, on the other hand, the, 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 the return, the, the, the comebacks after these kinds of liquidity squeezes is often very, very strong. For uh, we saw that in 2010, uh, where, where the market itself was up some 80 percent. And since the bottom of uh, of, uh, of the COVID uh, in, in 23rd of March, uh, I mean, small caps are up more than 100 percent in Sweden. So, so the, the comebacks are often very, very strong. But uh, but timing is it's impossible uh, to do. Yeah. One more also interesting thing is the the the, the risk, uh, the perceived risk in small caps is often very, I mean, it's very scary to, to be invested in, in small cap, small caps as such. And, and that is true for individual companies, but uh, as for, for uh, the aggregate of, uh, of small caps, the, the, the standard deviation or risk is actually lower than what it is for, for the large caps. And with a better return, the risk adjusted return over time has been significantly stronger for for uh, for small caps, which is very interesting. Why is that the case, you think? No, but I, I think it relates to uh, both the composition of small caps, which consists of some 250 to 300 companies, uh, which uh, uh, evens out uh, the, the fluctuations as such. Uh, and the small cap, uh, large cap uh, index is only 30 companies. So that could mm -hmm. explain something. But but then over this uh, time period since 2002, we've had 
uh, we've had uh, a, a crush uh, a crashed IT bubble where banks have suffered which are big in the in the omex index uh, which has uh, of course uh, uh, made the big caps suffer in that sense but uh, but still on an aggregate level i mean the the, the largest uh, the highest uh, risk or uh, volatility you can find in among the small caps but if you combine it to portfolio you could actually get it down pretty good mm -hmm. And, and uh, continuing the discussion on, on the Nordics as a small cap investment space, what is it that makes the Nordics so good in this context? I mean, uh, Nordics, uh, it, it has been very strong. We've generated good returns in, a, in an international perspective uh, and different here, different uh, kind of geographies. Geographies uh, tend to, to drive performance for Nordics, but but still, what we have in the Nordics is quite unique. With uh, we, I mean, the, the the thing that creates uh, good values on the on the exchange is good companies, and Nordics has been extremely good in creating good companies over a very very long time. I mean, look at the at, at that at the big caps we have in the Nordics. Uh, I mean, in, in Sweden with Volvo and, uh, and Atlas Copco, and uh, you have uh, in, in Finland, you have the Nokias and uh, Storenso, and uh, in, in Denmark, the Novo Nordisk and, uh, and, uh, and the hearing aid industry. It has created very strong hubs for, for developing, uh, 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 I mean, spin offs from, from these kind of companies and, and people leaving, good people leaving these kind of companies in order to pursue their own entrepreneurial. Uh, dreams has, has created very, very good companies over time. Uh, we, I mean, the Nordic region, we, we rank really high on innovation. Uh, all, of, all of the countries, we are, I mean, the, 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 the corporate governance structure as such is very reliable. Uh, we are reliable. We have small, um, small home markets. We need to look internationally from, from the beginning when we set up our companies. and. Uh, that creates uh, a, a will to grow and a will to to uh, to create value internationally. Um, so that is, uh, I mean, the the uh, the foundation for for creating good companies very very strong in the Nordic region, I think. Um, and Kenneth, you you run more of a European tilted fund or, or funds, but you also have a tilt towards the Nordics overall. Uh, what do you see in Europe uh, uh, compared to the Nordics? What, what are, are the co pros and cons in terms of companies and, and quality of companies? Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 one, one thing or one different, uh, 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 big different uh, thing for, for the companies in, in Europe is the fact that, uh, as Peter mentioned there, uh, if you compare uh, the Nordic and, uh, and the Nordic countries to, to many other countries in the world, uh, uh, the home markets are small and then uh, the Nordic companies need to go uh, to, to find growth uh, somewhere else. But, but then uh, if you look at, uh, at Europe, you have many uh, large uh, countries there. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Germany with 80 million people, I mean, uh, it's a huge region where the companies can work uh, uh, for a very long time, uh, using the same language, uh, same same legislation, same uh, uh, yeah, sa same culture overall. So so that is, of course, both uh, pros and cons, uh, yeah. uh, because it's all uh, for a company. It can also be quite risky to 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 go abroad, and then if you can work in your home country, then then. Uh, the risks uh, should be a little bit low, lower, but uh, but on 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 the other hand, it's also big differences between the countries in in Europe. So if I look at our European uh, European funds, uh, main part of the investments uh, we do and have done during since 2009, when we started our first uh, European small cap fund, is the fact that we invest. Uh, in the northern part of, of, of Europe. So Germany, uh, German speaking part of Europe has always been the largest uh, in, uh, part of, of, the of the funds, including the Nordics and then 
uh, from time to time also Great Britain, uh, mm. uh, where we were out for uh, during the Brexit time, but now have been starting to invest again because there you find interesting undervalued companies that have suffered a lot because of the uncertainty what comes to Brexit. Yeah. But but in Europe it's very div uh, uh, when you invest in in Europe it's uh, very uh, I mean it then you really talk about stock picking because uh, there are uh, huge differences between the countries the markets and and so forth so of course we find a couple of interesting names in in Italy for example or in Spain but but the main part is invested in the northern part of Europe. Yeah. I just want to highlight it. This, uh, this slide as well, which is uh, analytical coverage of smaller companies, which is, well, on the low side, to say the least, um, yeah. and which also brings brings you to the fact that, well, you need to do the analytical work yourself, and that is where you can find hidden gems, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, th this is what uh, Kenneth talked about earlier, about uh, the analyst coverage, and we, uh, this is the cohorts in, in the, in, we looked at the, the, the Swedish uh, small caps uh, according to the definition listed on, on the Stockholm Stock Exchange and uh, divided that into market cap ranges. And uh, I mean, the company is bigger than 25 billion. I mean, almost every company has uh, at least one analyst covering, or in average, actually nine analysts covering the companies. But if you, when you go down and uh, get down to the companies below two billion, uh, it's it's more than. It's, it's less than one third of the companies that actually have uh, any analysts looking at them whatsoever. So uh, they you actually they can. I mean, by by doing your homework and uh, and doing understanding these kinds of companies, you can actually find really good value if you find it early and can be able to invest. Uh, and you, and you you don't see that this is trend trend is changing. I mean that that more analysts are covering smaller companies these days than they used to like five years ago. All right. I think this picture has looked quite a lot, uh, more or less the same. Then, then of course, uh, um, I mean, th this, uh, I, I don't think this kind of picture covers, uh, uh, what is that called in English, uh, paid research that, that the companies pay pays okay. for research. Okay. But uh, yeah, of course, we have seen uh, a few more companies coming uh, coming on, but, but the picture is still the same, quite a lot mm -hmm. of uh, uh, non-analyzed companies out there mm. and i asked um, uh, kenneth to bring some uh, some company cases as well from from his portfolio uh we don't need to go through all of them but maybe you can highlight some of the names that you you invest in and why you do that yes okay i can uh, 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 mention a couple of, of, of these investments that we have in you know, European funds, and I have uh, not taken any any Nordic ones here because better we talk about that region a little yeah. bit more. So, but but uh, perhaps we could start with the the the, the two co companies that you see there on the on the left side, the Nexus AG and Styco, two uh, German companies. They have been in the in our microcap fund uh, since inception, uh, two thousand seventeen, and. Uh, <clears throat> Both companies uh, have been growing uh, very nicely. They have been, uh, especially Nexus, who is a software company with software uh, that is meant for, for the hospitals and the healthcare sector. Uh, uh, when we did the investment, it was a pure uh, German uh, company, only uh, uh, having clients in Germany. and. Uh, Nowadays, around 25% of, of the, the revenue comes uh, outside of Germany and a, a typical company that, that's growing organically, driven by uh, digitalization and uh, the de demographic team and uh, also uh, doing some smaller uh, acquisitions every now and then. Uh, so both growing uh, organically and uh, via acquisitions. And actually today, uh, the company's market cap is over our 800 million threshold that we have as as uh, as uh, as a maximum uh, market cap when when we invest in a, in a company so growing nice in the portfolio and uh, we see that uh, that the whole uh, whole of europe is opening up for them so this company can grow for for tens of years to come uh, Stico, um, 
a company that uh, um, produces uh, 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 isolation material for for uh, the building uh, and construction market. And uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, uh, their products are 100% uh, bi uh, bi based on on biomass. So so. Uh, the, the raw material is the forest, uh, uh, timber, and so forth. And 100% uh, of their products are bio-based. And, uh, and the penetration in the European market as of today is only 6%. So with huge potential for this company to grow, driven by, by, uh, driven, uh, by, by the uh, uh, Green Deal and, and uh, we only see we see two other uh, larger competitors that is working in the same space, but this company is the only one who has 100% of the products are bio based. So, growing nicely over time and uh, and uh, driven uh, driven by by climate change and in you know, an environmental type of, of legislation going forward. And then uh, uh, we have Marlow. Uh, great uh, company, uh, uh, only uh, only uh, uh, working in, in in Great Britain. It's a service type of company, uh, technical engineering type of company that is focusing on 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 uh, on um, also on buildings, uh, smart buildings, uh, 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 water, uh, air, uh, different type of security. Uh, Safety type of of, of uh, services and products for for buildings and and uh, and houses and here we also have this uh, legislation in in the background and this is also a typical Fondita company a compounder buying small local companies at low multiples integrating and then and uh, then organic growth on top of that and and has also been we have been investing in it for for many years and we see good potential for the company uh, as uh, as the, the the market is very fragmented going forward mm -hmm. and uh, Petra you brought some slides with you as well with uh, well, some Swedish companies that that you find of interest or actually one Swedish and one Finnish I think one but Finnish the, yeah okay yeah. Speaking about compounding companies this is uh, and compounding profits over time this is Bufa uh, which is a kind of a, a, a company which are involved in what's called C parts, and it's it's all the nuts and bolts, uh, uh, nuts and bolts, and uh, I mean uh, sheet metal product and stuff like that that goes into to I mean to the assembly of a dishwasher or a chainsaw or whatever. It's it's all the the, the small pieces that don't have any any value. Uh, for, for, for example, Husqvarna or Electrolux when they put together the products. They, uh, they buy this kind of uh, products from, uh, from uh, I mean, mainly Asia or uh, Eastern Europe and, uh, and then makes sure that, that this kind of nuts and bolts are in the right place on the right time in, uh, in the assembly factories at Husqvarna or uh, Electrolux or Volvo. Um, they have it's been around for quite some time. This company, they've been uh, they've been doing profits for the past forty years, uh, and and actually the the profit growth during the past five six years has been seventeen percent, driven by both an underlying market, which is uh, where the industrial companies are actually outsourcing this kind of uh, the handling of this kind of C parts to to companies like Bufab. Uh, they are taking market share in the European market and they are consolidating this uh, kind of market. So they have a combination of all three things that Kenneth mentioned that we like, uh, a structural underlying growth and, uh, and uh, M&A uh, roll-up potential. And they've been doing this very good and very steadily for the past year. And this is not a company that will show up in uh, uh, among the best performing, 10 best performing stocks on the Stockholm Stock Exchange uh, next year, but it will do their job over time and that's why we have it in the portfolio um, and then we have a i mean on the other end then we have a more of a growth story uh, a finnish company called admicom uh, which is a sas uh, software uh, which uh, uh, is used by uh, building and construction companies small and mid-sized uh, building and construction companies to to make their uh, processes 
it's a, uh, more efficient di digitalizing the, the construction industry in, in uh, Finland. Uh, they are the, the number one player in Finland. Uh, they have been growing very nicely uh, the past few years. 63% uh, average profit growth per year uh, during the past uh, five years. Uh, 2020 was a, a big hit to this company in terms of uh, the fact that they cannot, they have not been able to go out and sell their products. So. So, uh, so 2020 has been a dent in the, in, uh, in, in the growth story, but now that uh, Finland also will be opening up, hopefully, uh, there will be, in our view, a really good pent-up demand for this company to, to uh, continue to grow. Uh, and they are expanding uh, outside of Finland with their, uh, with their software, which is uh, apparently very good software. So we're looking forward to see what will happen to this company in the coming three years. Uh, we have high hopes. Mm -hmm. And and finally, I, I wanted to ask you a bit about the future because of obviously the, the history has been extremely good for, for small cap companies, but can this really repeat in the future, you think? Or what are the potential headwinds that you see in front of you when it comes to small cap investing? I mean, if you're a believer in in, in profit growth in, in the correlation of profit growth and uh, and fair price development, I see no reason why uh, small caps over time shouldn't outperform the large caps uh, going forward. Uh, I mean, the 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 fact that uh, that it's I mean, it's it's of course easier to to grow profits in a small company. Uh, I mean, both due to the fact that uh, you, I mean. The small caps as such are often more uh, exposed to structural changes. It would be digitalization, the ESG trend, uh, uh, an aging population with, uh, I mean, the medtech companies and stuff like that uh, speaks in favor of it. The M&A thing that you, that you actually can add a meaningful profit contribu contribution through, uh, through M&A. It has been a driver historically. Will it disappear only because it's uh, June 2021? I don't think so. So, so I mean, the the the, the parameters for growth, I mean, are, are hasn't changed uh, because of uh, I mean the pandemic and stuff like that. I think so. If you believe in in that kind of correlation between uh, share price development and profit growth, uh, small caps should be part of a, a portfolio, a long term portfolio. I think. Yeah. And what about the macro environment? I mean, uh, higher inflationary pressures and higher interest rates potentially would how would that play into the uh, growth story of smaller companies? Uh, of, of course, that I mean, higher inflation and uh, and higher uh, interest rates. Of course, uh, I mean we've seen that. I mean the inflationary scare and uh, the uptick in in uh, in interest rate has has put a. Uh, a lid on, uh, on on multiples in in uh, high growth stocks, but still, I think, I mean, um, I mean, and that, that is one part of the equation that uh, that is uh, that is the valuation multiple. But uh, does it change the the potential for these kinds of companies to grow? Well, maybe not. Maybe. Uh, uh, so I mean, over time, I, from my side, it's. Uh, I mean, multiples is, I mean, it's often only a number you need to, I mean, what you can do in, uh, in, in small caps is that you actually can invest in, in fantastic businesses. And uh, we try to invest in businesses and uh, operations and companies rather than uh, the shares as such. So if the multiple is 23 or 27, when we buy, if we stick to it through a long time and, and uh, profits develop, uh, develops, uh, favorably, it, it should create value to the portfolio. Kenneth, do you have the same view on, uh, on valuations I, I, and how that play into? Yeah, I, I tend to agree there with Petro. And and, uh, and uh, one thing that is very important when investing in, in smaller companies that you really need to be long term, because then, as Petro mentioned there, it doesn't matter if uh, the PE is 24 or 27 and, and uh, uh, on a company on a certain a certain year. and, and uh, you need to be long term and and what comes to to small caps versus large caps so actually if you look at at europe uh, uh, large caps uh, and and small caps they have have performed hand in hand this year 
and uh, which uh, I think uh, the reason is that uh, if you look at the large cap index in, in, in Europe, uh, you see you find a lot of uh, financials there, banks, uh, then you find raw material companies like oil companies and so forth and mining companies and and uh, what has happened uh, uh, this year? Okay, you have seen raw material prices going through the roof and you have seen interest rates uh, perhaps uh, starting to move a little bit upwards and, and uh, that tend to drive these type of companies. But, uh, but over time, uh, uh, if you look at banks or you look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, raw material companies, it's very, uh, I mean, they they okay they, they they are not not that profitable over time and and uh, so so at some point in time the focus will in Europe once again go back to to looking at, at the companies look uh, investing in in the companies and not just investing in a short term trend and then then we see that small caps will be the 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 place to be over time and yeah do you see any warnings of of bubble uh, bubbles in the space, given, for example, the ESG focus that has been, well, driving driving many companies' uh, uh, stocks uh, as a reason, recently. I can comment on that. I mean, we we saw kind of a bubble tendencies in, in the, uh, I mean, pure play ESG stocks in the Stockholm Stock Exchange, uh, or not in the stock, but uh, in the in the Swedish stock market during. Uh, I mean, December and January, uh, beginning of this year, uh, where where we saw uh, this kind of um, what was characterized as, uh, uh, I mean, en energy tech, uh, environmental tech kind of companies with uh, uh, no uh, just expectations and no uh, top, uh, no no sales or uh, huge uh, losses going up 50, 100, 200 uh, percent. That was, of course, bubble-like tendencies and that burst uh, sometime in January. So it, we, we have seen this kind of uh, tendencies in, uh, but, but, but still, um, uh, yeah, well, valuation, valuation multiples, they, they were high, but they have come back in, uh, in a lot of uh, growth sectors uh, during the past months where, when, when interest rates and an uh, inflationary threat uh, came back and we saw the sector rotation from, from growth to, to more of value. But uh, with bubble tendencies, I wouldn't say. Kenneth, from, from a European perspective, do you see anything there that... Uh, I mean, uh, w what we still see is that there are... Uh, could be a bubble tendency in, in some companies where 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 the the profits are very long into the future. I mean, the market is looking for profits in, I don't know, 2025 or 2027, 29. And there you have in many companies very high multiples. And, and uh, in those type of companies, there is still a bubble tendency, but we don't invest in those type of companies. So, so. We are not focusing that much on 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 that. Mm -hmm. Then I say thank you very much uh, to the both of you for joining in today. Uh, let's uh, have an eye on on the small cap space even going forward, and maybe we can have another chat in the autumn or something to to cover the yeah. space uh, again. Yeah. Thank you very much for now. Thank you very much. Good. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.